there is nothing that quite strikes fear into a financial modeler's heart than the possibility that there could be errors in the financial model. And this is the topic that I would like to talk to you about today. Hello and welcome. My name is Danielle Stein Fairhurst. I am a financial modeling specialist. I'm a Microsoft MVP uh, and financial modeling is my world. It is what I live and breathe. Here are the different types of model errors or the most common types of errors that we see and what we're going to talk about today is to try to reduce the possibility of this happening. So for formula errors, number one, I mean, these are the most career damaging uh, mistakes to make, you know, if you uh, if you were to submit a model uh, to your boss or someone and they were to look at the model and go, oh, that formula doesn't look right. That is probably one of the worst things that can happen to a modeler, uh, having a, a formula mistake. So we make formula mistakes all the time, but there are certain techniques that you can use to reduce the possibility for that happening. And we're going to talk about that today. So formulas errors are the easiest to make, but they're also the easiest to fix. Uh, secondly, incorrect assumptions or inputs, basically just assuming the wrong thing or just uh, you, the, the numbers that go into the model being wrong. That is a completely different type of error. Uh, it's just about you perhaps interpreting something incorrectly or uh, just using the wrong numbers in your model. That's a, that's a completely different type of er error. Similarly, uh, equally as, uh, as horrifying for it to happen. Um, and then lastly, logic error can also be quite difficult to identify. So next, we are going to jump into some tips, tricks, do's and don'ts for best practice financial modeling. Now, best practice is such an important point that there is actually an entire chapter dedicated to uh, best practice in financial modeling from each of these books. So for financial modeling for dummies, it is chapter four and using Excel for business and financial modeling, it is chapter three. So the entire chapter is all about financial modeling best practice. But a lot of best practice is the reason it is best practice is because it will reduce the possibility for errors in your financial model because we know that errors is probably one when you ask people the uh, the dangers or the risks of using excel very often they will say the possibility of having errors in your model that is probably one of the biggest risks in using excel and in financial modeling so a lot of the points of best practice that we are going to cover now are going to uh, help to reduce the possibility for errors. So we've already talked a bit about assumptions. So I'm going to go into a little bit more detail now on how you can document those assumptions. Uh, we'll also talk about how to build those formulas, how to create and make those um, mop those formulas consistent. We'll look at some linking, um, entering only entering the data once. We'll revisit those error checks. Uh, and lastly, we'll talk about formatting and labeling. So number one is documentation of assumptions. We've already talked about why documenting assumptions is really important, but it's very important to keep it, uh, to keep all of your assumptions um, ideally on one page so that you can at any point in time show somebody uh, what the assumptions are that went into the model. And I often even uh, will list who is responsible for the assumptions. Um, as a financial modeler, you may or may not be uh, responsible for those, uh, for the actual numbers that go into it. Personally, I am a, uh, I'm a financial modeling specialist. I'm not a subject matter specialist. So I rely very heavily on clients to tell me what those assumptions are, what numbers we should use in the model. Uh, and so I make it very, very clear where those assumptions came from, who gave them to me, what, uh, you know, what report did we use um, and have links and hyperlinks to show where they came from. If you're uh, in the business, if you have a lot of expertise, then uh, you 
you would perhaps be responsible for the um, for the assumptions that go the the actual numbers that go into the models and are being used for the calculations. So the more detail, the better. Um, do not leave documentation to the end. I know it's not the most exciting part is to do documentation, but you will not remember uh, what the what the assumptions were. So as you're building the assumptions into the model, make sure you make it really really clear uh, what that what what assumptions you've used, what you've done and why you've done it. Because not only is it going to help you, it's going to help your colleague um, and even you six months down the road when you probably have no idea uh, what assumptions you used there. So your model, you want to make sure that your model can speak for you, that uh, when you have moved on to bigger and better things, of course, because you have such fantastic financial modeling skills, you have gone on to a bigger and better job and perhaps uh, uh, yeah that you're you're not may not be around people will be using your model so you want to make sure that people can understand what you've done and why you've done it in your model because sometimes if you're not around they may not think that your model is correct or you want to make it really really clear uh, what is in your model so that your model can uh, can speak for you after you have perhaps moved on. So let's have a look at some of the uh, tools in Excel that you can use to document those assumptions. So let's have a look at each of these. We're going to have a look at creating these little um, triangle, we call them red triangle comments, or well, actually in the latest version in um, Excel 365, they are now called notes. Uh, we'll also, um, and also some comments as well. So different types of um, of little comments that you can put into Excel to document your models. We'll also have a look at using data validation, some footnoting, hyperlinks, my favorite, which is hard coded text, which is simply just typing it out. Uh, or lastly, looking at some linked and dynamic text. So let's jump over into Excel now and have a look at how to create each of these. Now, this is called a note, uh, this one here. So to create a note, is to just click on the cell and then we just go into a new note like that and that is going to create a note. This one here is a comment. So to create a comment, we would say go right click and go new comment. Now these uh, with the red triangle, they used to be called comments, they are now called notes. So they have changed uh, what they are called now in Excel. Uh, the great thing about the, uh, the, the comments now is that you can actually have these threaded comments and you can even in uh, in in excel online you can have a resolved thread which is a, a, a fantastic tool for sharing workbooks uh, between colleagues so definitely uh, recommend doing that now these are for certain for certain types of assumptions this might be appropriate now the reason I don't use these kind of uh, comments and notes very much because uh, they kind of look a little bit ugly. They mess up the, uh, I suppose, the aesthetics of the model. You don't see them unless you hover over it like that. So um, they don't print very well. You need to actually change the options so that they print. And when you do print, they obscure other parts of the model. So they're probably best for um, just little little aside notes, some sort of message that you want to leave for the other modeler. They're not going to it's only really a soft copy thing. They're only going to be doing it while they're going into the mod, into the soft version of the model. So not great for hard copy. Um, so certain situations, when it's something really quite minor, something that's not terribly important, uh, you might put into a comment. You just want to leave like a little comment for someone else. So that's one method of doing assumptions documentation. Uh, I quite like these little data validation comments. So you don't see them unless you click on so they make them a little bit more subtle but they do kind of pop up and you can um, they, they're just a little bit nicer looking so the way that we do that is using a data data validation and uh, we go into so normally if you wanted to do uh, you know if you wanted to restrict the um, the numbers that go into the model so if you wanted to uh, go into here and say it needs to be a whole number it needs to be decimal or you want to create a drop down list or something like that you would do it here but here is where you would do it you would put in your input message and you could also do an error alert so that is how that one has been built I quite like those so it just gives you a uh, ah uh, gives you a little uh, a little warning there so I quite like those those are, those are really quite useful 
The next one is footnoting. So going into the Excel footnotes, you go to page layout and go into here and you can go into the, um, the header and the footers here. Uh, I am not a huge fan of that. Um, I do, um, you know, go into custom footer there. You can't link to it. Uh, it's, yeah, you're not going to see it unless you print. Uh, I personally don't use that a huge amount. I mean, it's 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 there if you if you want to uh, want to use it. Sometimes it's quite useful to see the file path or the tab name or something like that. Um, you might like that. I find for financial modeling, I certainly find this kind of thing a lot uh, more useful. Having uh, little uh, little footers. This is in Word. Uh, it does it really easily. Uh, it doesn't do it quite so well in Excel. You need to actually highlight this, and you'd need to go into the um, into the font and actually change it to a superscript to show it as a superscript like that and then you would have um, like that so you would have a um, you know a little footnote at the bottom and this will print out really nicely so if you were to go into printing you can see that it prints quite well uh, if you are going to do that though I do quite like making this dynamic so uh, we'll have a look at that uh, in a second uh, hyperlinks you can uh, pop in you know the source you know where did you get it from uh, where, where, wherever wherever it comes from that will that will uh, create a hyperlink to uh, to the, the website um, or you can actually do hyperlinks within the model so you can go into um, uh, into the links like that and place in this document and you could um, jump to uh, certain parts of the model so you could say I want to jump to footnoting go to there and it's not a bad idea for um, for a table of contents or something like that you know you can jump to different parts of the model like that uh, so you can create uh, that or you could actually put in uh, the an, an actual file so you can embed a file uh, where particularly if you want to show if there's a whole report on where you got your numbers from and you don't want to put all of the entire report in the model but you also don't want to have an external link so it's not a bad idea to have that as a as a hyperlink so that somebody can find it of course um, you know within within the uh, internal file directory at the company uh, so hard coded um, that's my favorite just showing um, you know making it really clear uh, or, or similarly putting uh, as, as you would with uh, with with a footnote, uh, just showing it, making it really clear rather than actually putting it inside the cell. So you can see straight away, it prints really well um, and there's no sort of worrying about uh, whether it's going to show. Uh, lastly, uh, have, making it dynamic is, uh, is really good. So having a link. So what we've done here is used an ampersand. You can use a concat or a concatenate. You could say that cell ampersand that cell is going to string them together so if we were to say 2021 ampersand 15065 like that is going to string the two together like that and so that's what I've done here I've actually used uh, some tech some uh, inverted commas around the uh, the the words and then I've used a text formula to format it so if we were to say uh, number of, of customers ampersand and then link it to here like that that is just giving me 15065 so I want to actually format it nicely or you could say equals gross inverted commas growth rate is space close inverted commas ampersand and link it to here so it's giving me 0.05 you could multiply it by 100 and then put a percentage on but it is better to use a text function so you would say text open bracket and then hash see how many decimal places it would be five percent it would be um, hash dot hash hash if you wanted to have multiple uh, decimal places so it's something like that um, that would uh, link it together and then of course if your growth rate were to change six percent 
enter, you can see that it um, it will the numbers will automatically change, and uh, and the documentation of assumptions will automatically change as well. Uh, when it comes to documenting assumptions, this is my preferred method, just because uh, you know I, I know when we are wanting to document our assumptions, we'll often uh, perhaps put it in a Word document or a PowerPoint document. You want to summarize all of the document, all of the um, assumptions documentation in the model. And the minute you take it out of Excel and put it into Word, it's going to be out of date. So doing it like this is, um, it, I do recommend it because uh, if somebody were to change um, any of the inputs, it's going to automatically change the text as well. So usually, all of my assumptions, uh, you can you can set up your assumptions page so it doesn't look like it came out of Excel you can create um, you know something that looks like it's a nicely formatted word document but in fact is actually the the uh, assumptions are coming from uh, from the assumptions in your financial model so that any change uh, is just going to flow throughout the numbers will change and the assumptions will not be out of date ever Okay, so that was number one of documenting your assumptions. So number one point of financial modeling best practice was documentation of assumptions. And we've had a look at how to document those assumptions. Let's have a look at the second point of financial modeling best practice now. And this is to use consistent formulas. Now, this is something that... Um, yeah, it's actually uh, really quite uh, common sense to a lot of people, but it's a, I'm, I'm constantly um, surprised by the number of quite competent Excel users that don't do this naturally. So let me give you an example. So let's say here you are wanting to borrow $250,000 by 7.5%, so you could go like this. Now I know equals a three no we wouldn't do it like that we go equals left arrow multiplied by up arrow enter and then we go to the next one like that multiply like that and we go to this one like that multiply no we would not do it like that a much smarter way to do that would be to use your um, mixed referencing so dollar sign goes in front of the column if you want to fix the column dollar sign goes in front of the row if you want to fix the row and the shortcut to do that is using F4 so we would go equals left arrow F4 so F4 is going to throw in two dollar signs hit it again it's going to take one away hit it again it's going to move it from the row to the column and just keep hitting your f4 shortcut so grab this file and try this out for yourself because this is really important modeling best practice so equals left arrow hit your f4 until the dollar sign goes in front of the a and that is going to anchor the a column multiplied by up arrow hit your f4 again a couple of times enter and then we can copy it across and down enter or you can go um, highlight the whole lot, Control R, Control D, um, Control Z to undo, or you can just go drag, copy down like that. Using consistent formulas is a really important part of financial modeling best practice. So you can see there F2, F2, yep, you can see that it's picking it up. Now, if you, now that's absolutely fine i think that's a great way of doing it now if you're using excel 365 you may prefer to use dynamic arrays so that would be the entire range like that and then the entire range like that enter and that is going to fix the whole lot across like that not a bad way to do it except it's kind of hard because you can't you can't sort of see like we did with this one you want you could see exactly what's which is picking up which cell okay but it's still it's accurate, um, faster, um, yeah. So that's a, a, another way to do it. Now, you may have used named ranges before. So using named ranges, we can name that range. We can call it, uh, we often use named ranges in models, particularly if it's an assumption that you are referring to over and over again. So you might use a, a named range for that. So let's say here, if we were to say interest rate, underscore one we can't use int one because that is a that is a uh, um, a cell reference interest rate one and then we could go here and we can say interest rate underscore two go for interest rate underscore three for that All right and we could go equals left arrow so we'd still need to anchor column a with that f4 multiplied by ah interest rate one so the great thing about a, a uh, 
named range is that you can see it so you can see that then it gives the the cell a name so that you can read it uh, rather than giving it a cell reference so so you can copy across and down ah okay so that's now picking up the all right so we're gonna have to f2 and change that to two and i'll go to this one to there and change that to a three and then we need to copy that across and, yeah not a great way to do it. Uh, named ranges are, are good. They are a useful tool uh, in when you're building financial models, but not this is not a great use of, uh, of using named ranges. I do not recommend doing it like that. If you do want to use a named range, you could do something like this. You could say borrowing. So you could highlight the entire lot like that. Enter. So enter is going to create the named range highlight the next lot here call that uh that was borrowing hang on i've no that was not borrow so uh, i did not mean to do that but i'm going to show you now how to change it so if you go to name manager here go to borrowing and you could edit it like that or you could go to here and just go to delete and that is going to delete it so i'm going to call it interest because that's what i intended to call it enter and then this one here is going to be borrowing borrowing there so I can just type interest multiplied by borrowing tab enter so hmm didn't work terribly well yeah because because uh, it's picking up from here so my range actually should have started from there I should not have included that one so let's go back into here we can now edit that so we could start from uh, change that to Instead of 20, let's change that to 21. Say OK. And then we can do the same thing for the interest. Go to edit and we can change that so that it starts from column B. I'm going to say OK. All right, that's looking much better. Again, it is uh, using a dynamic array. If you're not using 365, this will, will also work. But if you are using uh, Excel on Microsoft 365, you'll see that it's a little blue line around the outside. And that means um, that you are using a dynamic array. So going back to this one here, consistent formulas are a really good part of uh, financial modeling best practice. So the first way, there is absolutely nothing wrong with doing it that way. I quite like doing it that way. You can use dynamic arrays if you like. I do not recommend doing it like that because you've got it's, it's basically not consistent formula so don't do it like that or you can use uh, named ranges in that way so you could either of those is a good option except for that one uh, or there's absolutely nothing wrong with doing it that way as well so that is the second point of financial modeling best practice is to use consistent formulas so that you have one single formula all the way across and down the entire block of data and in order to do that you should be using absolute um, or, or mixed cell referencing to do that so the next part of financial modeling best practice is to link not hard coding so always link as much as you possibly can so we talked about the definition of a financial model is that if you change the inputs the outputs change as well but this will only work if you have actually linked the cells together so uh, you, linking from external files is um, is not a great idea unless you absolutely have to if you do need to link from one file to another using named ranges is going to work a lot better uh, it is good to be able to trace source data with those links we're going to take a look at that also uh, the only hard coding should be input variables and uh, one of the fairly commonly used uh, practices that a lot of modelers put input variables in blue font or they use uh, the styles so let me show you what i mean there so you might have noticed here that we have used i'm um, going to home and cell style and we can use uh, you can create your own i've actually created these styles or you can use uh, this input style here that microsoft has created for you so here you can see uh, that if you were to, uh, you've got a, um, a this is driving uh, the model. So here I've done, uh, again, like we talked about having uh, the dynamic 
linked uh, documentation. So if I were to change my cost of capital to nine, you have one single cell that is changing uh, the formulas all the way throughout. Everything is flowing through. And I've even got that linking to the title of my chart. So if I were to change that to something else, you can see that the numbers change, the chart will change and everything will flow throughout as well. So always, um, always linking as much as you can uh, right throughout the model. Here's an example of a, of a corkscrew cash flow. You've got your opening balance links down to your closing balance and your opening balance. So the closing balance of uh, the month before is, is directly linked to the opening balance of the following month. So having that link uh, means that it's automatically going to calculate. So having this surplus deficit, uh, all of these should be formulas that are going to dynamically change so that as this is part of your financial model, it will automatically uh, flow through. So uh, following on from there, we only we never enter the same value twice. So enter it once as a source. So you have your assumptions and you link, you reference that one cell. So you would never use a value within a formula. So you wouldn't type out something like that. The only exception to that would be something like 12, like 12 months in a year. Not generally a variable, not something I think is going to necessarily going to change in the near future. So if you do divide something by 12, I think that's probably okay. But generally we do not type hard coded numbers into formulas. So we try to avoid uh, daisy chaining or what we call spaghetti links. So when you are linking to a link to a link right throughout the model. Let's have a look now at an example. So uh, let's have a look at this one here. So you can see here we've got a start date. So the start date is January 22. Everything is flowing on from there. So we've used an EO month. So that takes us to the last day of the month and plus one uh, is going to give us the first day of the month after that. So if I were to, if I wanted to change that, if I were to say, well, actually, we're going to start from July and you can see that that's going to flow everything on from there. So one single cell for our start date and that is going to flow on everything from their control Z to undo that. Uh, similarly, all of these uh, calculations are flowing on from there. So we never ever repeat anything in our formulas. Everything is linking to the one single cell and the formulas flow from that. Okay, next is number five, you guessed it. Yes, error checks as number five point of financial modeling best practice is to use error checks. So here are some examples of some of the error checks. We've already taken a look at some of those. Uh, equals equals is quite a nice one. We've looked at uh, trying to, uh, to stop the uh, truncation and to allow a tolerance for error. A uh, couple of different options there, and we also talked about create, considering making a summary page of all of those error checks. So the next point and the last point of financial modeling best practice is formatting and labeling. Now, this is definitely to do with errors and reducing the possibility of error. So one of the most common sources of errors in financial modeling is mixing up the units. So mixing apples and oranges, for example, or mixing, mixing up uh, US dollars versus uh, Australian dollars or something like that. So that's a really common source of error. So labeling can stop that from happening. So using symbols for your currency and percentages, for example, it makes your model easier to read and it can really avoid mistakes and interpretation. So format it as a, as, a, as a currency or whatever it is and also put labels at the top of whatever it is. Is it meters? Is it kilometers? Is it uh, kilograms, uh, what is a uh, tons, what is the uh, what is the metric, what is the unit that's being measured that can really reduce possibility for error and reduce confusion to be perfectly honest. So uh, columns and row headings should only have one unit or currency headings and they should only contain one type of unit or currency. So labeling your data is really important as well. So all of these points are going to make your life so much easier, particularly when it comes to reducing errors in your financial model.